Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one, really digging into the understanding, the reading between the lines, if you will, on the book of Ephesians. And this particular lesson is number six in that series for August 5 of 2023, entitled, The Mystery of the Gospel. Should good news be a mystery? Shouldn't Good news should be told to everybody, shouldn't it? Well, we'll see what we can learn. Another way of saying it, the, the, the uh, message to, that can make you good. Should It should. That's, I mean, isn't that the purpose of it? The way, way yeah. Jesus <laughs> yeah. has a message? Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we bow before you now, recognizing that in this book, the small book of Ephesians, there are a lot of very powerful ideas. Help us to see what's here and learn what we can learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 3 is packed with many ideas which have, been deep, which have deep implications. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul indicates that he had been commissioned by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He suggested that Gentiles and Jews together will form the final church of God and demonstrate to the onlooking universe that it is possible for people who have been alienated and opposed to each other to come together in God's plan as his united family. Even so, Paul recognized that he was in a Roman prison because of his desire to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And I, when, I, when I read something like that, which is absolutely true, I think, you know, what did the, what did the devil... Try to imagine the devil speaking to his uh, allies there, starting with the birth of Jesus and right through this whole process. And when he thinks he's just about got things in, then all of a sudden here comes someone like Paul shows up. Yeah. <laughs> what? And, and what do you do, you know? Well, look at Ephesians 3. It's not, it's not a real long chapter. Carrie, I mean, I'm sorry, Jim, can you read that for us? This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you. Let me interrupt there for a second. This is one of the reasons why there's very good evidence that this wasn't just written to the Ephesians. Remember, he spent three years in the church at Ephesus. And so he wouldn't say, presumably, surely you've already heard. He was, this was to be re circulated to all the churches in Asia Minor. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I, am, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power, although I am very, excuse me, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety made, excuse me, might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was, a, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he was, has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have across Access. Him have access to God in boldness and a confidence through faith in Him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. From the, wow. And the prayer for the uh, readers. Okay. You want to pick up Carrie there with verse 14? Yes. 
For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now That's quite a statement. What's that? That's quite a statement, yeah. filled with all the fullness of God. We'll talk more about what that might mean. Yeah. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory to the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's from the New Revised Version. As outlined in the teacher's Bible study guide, this lesson highlights three main themes. Paul's prayer and ideal for the church was to view the church as the new humanity, including the Gentiles, and we would add the angels. Two, the inclusion of the Gentiles was God's great mystery and surprise to humanity. Paul was the humble steward of this mystery. Paul wanted to include not only the Gentiles, remember, but also beings from the entire universe. I mean, and, and you, you have to do that if you're really taking the big picture because God is going to have us all one time living together. That's in a state of at one -ment. Yes. That's what, everything God has been doing from the time he began to create intelligent creatures way back mm -hmm. is to bring harmony, have the, the system operate as a, as a harmonious whole. Mm -hmm. Because Three, because of the inclusion of the Gentiles and thus of all humanity in the plan of salvation, the church became the display of God's wisdom, love, power, and glory, both on earth and throughout the universe. And the teacher's Bible study guide finally mentions the universe. That's for the Bible study guide on page 80. Ephesians 3 begins with Paul telling the Ephesians that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What do you think Paul was trying to say by claiming that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Was he suggesting that he was imprisoned because of Jesus Christ? Or that he was somehow in God's hands and it really did not matter what Rome or Nero did to him? Compare Romans, compare, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4.1 where he, also was, he was also called a prisoner. From our Bible study guide, Kerry. Uh, Paul's mention of his suffering, Ephesians 3.13, and his later mention of his change, Ephesians 6.20, ESV there, suggests that he is not under relatively comfortable house arrest. Compare Acts 28.16. Let's look at that for just a moment. We're going we're gonna, to, well, here, let me just look at it down here in a moment. We can just drop down here. I put it in here so we can look at it. There it is. Go ahead and read that. Well, I'll read it for you. Acts 28, 16. When we arrived in Rome, this is Paul on his last trip to Rome before he was finally beheaded. Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier guarding him, what we would call house arrest, okay? But now, it's, apparently things have changed. Um, so there, right at the top there. Go ahead. Um. Being in, the, being in prison in the first century and in Roman dungeon uh, was especially challenging. The Roman Empire did not run well-organized prisons with sanitary facilities and regular meals uh, service. Wait a minute, I'm busy. yeah, I got it. In fact, the empire had little need for prisons since incarceration was not used as a means of punishment. People were placed in prison only while they awaited trial or execution. Prisoners were... Well, well, let's think about what that means. How well would you sleep at night if you knew that any morning you woke up, you might have your head chopped off? Yeah, it could... Uh, and they weren't sleeping on a, some kind of 
<laughs> you know, no. thermal mattress or something. Yeah. Okay. Prisoners were expected to provide for themselves and were dependent on relatives and friends to supply food and other needs. Wow. Ah, boy. A Bible study guide for Sunday. Even though Paul was a prisoner when he was first arrived in Rome, it appears that at that time he had relative freedom and was allowed to be under house arrest. Now, do we know when the book of Ephesians was written? There's pretty good evidence that the book of Ephesians and Colossians were written at the same time, and probably the small book of... Um, well, it's, I think it's, what's the little tiny book right there before Hebrews? Um, anyway, the three of those books were written at the same time, and just before Paul was actually released. Philemon. Philemon, Philemon yeah. Uh, yeah. How would you feel if you had a personal friend? Think about this. You have a personal friend who was a pastor. That friend was in prison, and he sent you a letter saying that he was in prison for your sake. Hmm. That kind of thing is happening here and there today. Yeah. In some parts of the world. So what can give Christians hope even if they are under this kind of stressful situation? This is the reason for constantly keeping the perspective of the great controversy over the character and government of God on everything, on everything that happens. We know who the eventual, eventual winner is going to be, so we need to place our trust in him. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 6, Paul mentions that Gentiles who are, are to become fellow heirs with Jews. I'm going to read that again. We looked at it just a moment, but let's look at it here again really quickly here. If I can make it a little bit easier to read here. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, we've just talked about that, pray to God. Surely you have heard that God in his grace has given me this work to do for your good. God revealed his secret plan and made it known to me. I have written briefly about this, and if you will read what I read, what I have written, you can learn about my understanding of the secret of Christ. In past times, human beings were not told this secret, but God has revealed it now by the time, I'm sorry, by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The secret is that by means of the gospel, the Gentiles, have a part with the Jews in God's blessings. They are members of the same body and share in the promise that God made through Christ Jesus. Now we, with our understanding of the great controversy, would want to include who else in that mystery? Beings in the heavenly places. The entire universe, yes, exactly. Paul mentions in these verses, we just noticed, that Gentiles are to become fellow heirs with Jews members of the same body and are to share in the promises from Christ Jesus through the gospel. Um, you know, the, the formerly Jew, Jewish Christians had a hard time sitting next to a, a Gentile in a Christian church because, you know, if you get too close, you might be contaminated, yeah. you know? So um, imagine Paul saying, okay, I'm going to, there's a brick there, and here's another brick here, and you're here, and that's you. You know, <laughs> He's saying, you're going to be permanently right next to this brother that you can't stand. Okay, Carrie, I think you're next. Okay, where are we first? I, can't... I think it is. First, Paul yeah. writes to this part of the letter specifically to Gentile believers in the house churches of Ephesus. That's from Ephesus 3.1 and the surrounding areas. We've already talked about that. that this, wasn't letter, this letter wasn't just for the Jew, just for the Gentiles in Ephesus. Okay. Second, Paul claims to be the recipient of something he labels the stewardship rather of God's grace given to him for you, for Gentile believers from Ephesians 3.2. This stewardship or this ministry of grace is Paul's way of describing the commission given to him to preach the gospel, and in brackets, God's grace, to the Gentiles. Compare Ephesians 3, 7 and 8. 
Do you think Paul ever argued with God about whether or not he should go preach to the Gentiles? <laughs> what a change happened in him. Yeah. Remember that Paul was later ar arrested in Jerusalem because he was seen on the streets associating with Gentiles. And then he was accused of taking them into the temple in Jerusalem. Not only that, unfortunately, even his fellow apostles, some of whom were former disciples of Christ, did not stand up for Paul to prevent this from happening. And you can read about that in Acts of the Apostles, pages 400 to 405. It's terrible. It's just terrible. We can't believe that, you know, they had prejudices against Paul. Okay, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. Let's notice these words. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. I'm going to hesitate there for a second. Why would he call himself less than the least of all God's people? Any idea? I'm pretty sure it's because of what he did to the Christians before he became a Christian. That could be, yeah. And of making all people see how God's secret plan, there's a secret plan, the mystery again, is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that the present, at the present time, by means of the church, who does that include? All of us. The angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. And we read last week's lesson, 1 Peter. He said, you know, even the angels want to learn these things. Well, here it is again in Paul's writings. What do you think the angels thought as they watched the Jews despising Gentiles and the Gentiles despising Jews? Then what did they think when suddenly a Pharisee of the Pharisees who had been foremost in promoting the special privileges of Jews and busy hunting down Christian believers was spreading the gospel not only to Jews, but also especially to Gentiles. Don't you think they were rejoicing when that happened? Yeah. I hope so. Can't be too sure, but I hope so. What did Paul think when God had a personal message for him through Ananias? Look at this message. Jim? Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him, that is Paul, to is it, serve yeah. me. Okay. To make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to peoples of Israel. And I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. From the Good News Bible. Imagine God saying to Ananias, I mean, Paul, Paul is just, he's been in the darkness for three days because there's scales on his eyes. And so it's the first thing that happens to him, the first real contact with Christians, other than trying to torture Christians, he says, guess what? You get to be a, <laughs> a messenger to Gentiles and to kings. I wonder how Paul digested that one. Yeah. Paul claimed that it was his ministry to teach that all God's people, in fact, that all human beings were supposed to be a part of God's plan to be united and to live with the angels in heaven for eternity. He knew that this would not happen, but it was God's original plan because we all should be still living in the Garden of Eden, right? Yeah. So Paul described Christ as breaking down the barriers that had separated Jews and Gentiles. He was probably thinking about the four-foot-high wall around the central part of the temple in Jerusalem, displaying notices in Greek and Latin at various places along that wall saying that Anyone who was not a Jew would die if you stepped inside that wall. How many Americans today with their attitudes would step their foot inside there just to see what would happen? <laughs> While Paul claimed to be the special messenger to Gentiles, he believed that God's message was intended to go to all peoples even in Old Testament times. He believed that Jews and Gentiles could join together in perfect unity to become co-heirs, co-bodied, if you will, as, 
and co-partakers of the gospel promise. This new community would include not just Jews and Gentiles, but would also include the entire universe. So, are there barriers which separate people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in our day? What can we do to break down those barriers? I think probably most of it's down, but there are some there, here and there. Oh, yeah. Well, Ephesians 3, 7 to 13, I think that's yours, Carrie. Okay. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. So here we go. There's another reference, specific reference to heavenly beings, angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world learning about God. Go ahead. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord. In union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with all confidence. I beg you then not to be discouraged because I am suffering for you. It is all for your benefit from the Good News Bible. So this passage raises several questions. One, why did Paul say that he was less than the least of all God's people? Well, I give you one possible suggestion. Two, who are the angelic rulers and powers? Are those good angels? Or are they beings living All in the... The good, the good and the bad. Okay. Three, what could they possibly learn from us? They learn how evil works. Many cycles. What it does. How it ends up in death. Now, what it does to people. Yeah. Four, had the universe ever seen God deal with sinners before sin came to our world? Well, we have the example of the war that happened in heaven recorded in Revelation 12. We don't know how long that was before sin came to this world, but it couldn't have been too long. Okay, there's an interesting progression in Paul's self-understanding, in other words, his description of his personal standing, that is discernible as we move through Paul's letters in the order they were written. Not the order in the Bible, but the order in which they were written. Early on, he lays claim to his status as a divinely appointed apostle. Now, if you're saying you're a divinely appointed apostle, where does that put you? Hey, you're up there pretty high, right? Yeah, so. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Let's look at that really quick. Look what he says. From Paul, whose call to be an apostle did not come from human beings or by, or by human beings, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father, I raised him from death. So, where did my call come from, Paul says? Father and Son, right? Later, though, he introduces himself as the least of the apostles and not worthy to be called an apostle. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of all the apostles. Now, we just read that here in in Ephesians, I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted God's church. Now, there's an idea. That gives you a clue about what he was thinking when he said that. Okay? Um, so now, from being a divinely appointed apostle, he calls himself the least of the apostles, but he's still an apostle, not worthy to be called an apostle. Here in Ephesians, he sees himself as the very least of all the saints. Who are the saints in Paul's mind? All the church members, weren't they? Yeah. He, every, he addresses a church somewhere it's to all the saints in such and such a place. So now he's the least, of, he claims to be least than, the, the, than the, the church members, not 
not the apostles. Finally, he describes himself as the chief or worst of sinners, 1 Timothy 1, 15, Ephesians 3, 8. Perhaps this line of thinking here by Paul can help explain this famous quotation by Ellen White from The Steps to Christ, which follows. Um, Ellen White. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will seem in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Steps to Christ 64, paragraph 2. Could it be that bringing together Gentiles and Jews and uh, making them into one united family was a warning even to the demonic rulers that God's ultimate place to bring the universe back into harmony was being ultimate plan, I'm sorry, for to bring the universe back into harmony was being fulfilled. I mean, you wonder as Paul as God does each one of these things, and don't you suppose that his secret plan was primarily to keep it out of the hands of the devil? I mean, who does God not want to understand his plan most of all? I think it would have to be devil, right? Yeah. Could it be, uh, let's see. So God wants to restore the harmony that used to exist in the entire universe. And he is determined to do that at all costs. Jim? If so, the composition of the church, unifying Jews and Gentiles as once very divided parts of humankind, becomes a ringing announcement in these demonic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places of God's plan for the future, to unite all things in him, that is Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, Ephesians 1.10. They are put on notice that God's plan of, is underway and their doom assured. The very nature of a unified church signals their ultimate defeat. Okay, that's from August 1, Bible study guide for August 1. Are we taking this unifying message from Paul seriously? Are we constantly aware that God is trying to use us to demonstrate his grace, his forgiveness, and his love to sinners? Now that demonstrate, that means what he's doing is trying to educate mm -hmm. not just humans, but the heavenly intelligences. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, this is early proof to them that God will successfully complete his mission on earth and unite his family on earth with his family in heaven. God is winning the great controversy. So now Paul is writing this to the Ephesians in the early days of the Ephesian church. And what does Revelation tell us about the early days of the Ephesian church? Must have been pretty amazing because remember you have lost your first love. So it, de it deteriorated later, but apparently it was pretty remarkable at the beginning, right? Yeah. Well, Ephesians 1, 6 to 19, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, and these two prayer passages. So Paul is talking to the Gentiles and talking to the Jews, and then he, he offers prayers. And these two, we don't have time to read them. Paul talked about how God, through his power and the Holy Spirit, had called Jews and especially Gentiles into the wonderful blessings he had promised to his people. They are to become a unified whole. When they come to understand God's love, it will transform them. Now, okay, Carrie, can you read that Ephesians 3 there? Yeah. For this reason, oh, wait a minute. I just lost it. There it is. It went up. Sorry. Yeah. For this reason I fall on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its true name. I ask God from the wealth of his glory to give you power through his Spirit to be strong in your inner selves. And I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. I pray that you may have your roots and foundation in love so that you, together with all God's people, may have the power to understand how broad and how long, how high and deep is Christ's love. Yes, may you 
Come to know his love, although it can never be fully known and so be completely filled with the very nature of God. That's from the Good News Bible. So what does it mean to know God's love and to be fully, completely filled with the very nature of God? Yeah. Ellen White, I think in six or seven hundred times in her writings, talks about becoming partakers of the divine nature. So here we have it from the straight out of the Bible. Our Bible study guide says behind the English translation of Ephesians 4, 3, 14, and 15 is an important play on words. When Paul says that he bows before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that's from the English Standard Version, he's exploring the phonetic connection between the Greek word for father, pater, and the Greek term for family, patria. In Ephesians, Paul celebrates the comprehensive nature of God's plan of salvation, which involves all things for all time. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 and 21. And here he lays claims to every family in heaven and on earth as belonging to the Father. Every family, the patria, takes its name from the Father pater. This is very good news. Ponder this thought. Your family, despite its imperfections and failings, belongs to God. Your family is not in the cruel grip of fate, but in God's caring hands. God loves imperfect human, imperfect families. They bear the divine name. They carry the mark of his ownership from, from Bible study guide for Wednesday, August 2. Earlier in the prayer recorded in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, Paul reminded his listeners or his readers that when it is all finished, Christ will be exalted to be ruler over everything in the entire universe. So if you're part of the temple and Christ is the chief cornerstone and now he's going to be ruler over the entire universe, where does that put you? Well, the kings and priests, right? Yeah. And who, and, priests. and who says that we're going to be kings and priests? Yahweh. He said that back to the Jews in... Exodus 19, and who later picked it up? Peter picked it up, and he says it applies now to Christians. Okay? So, uh, in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, we read, For this reason I, I'm sorry, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit which will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know Him. I ask you that your minds may be open to see His light so that you will know what is the hope to which He has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings He promises His people, and how very great is His power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and, see at, and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all health, heavenly rulers, authorities and powers and lords. He has a little, I'm sorry, he has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. And we're getting lots of chances to uh, read from the book of Ephesians here, so we'll all have a pretty good idea what it says by the time we're finished. We are the most privileged people who have ever lived on this earth. We have the scriptures, translated into languages that we can clearly understand. If you don't like it in one translation, you read it in a different translations. How many trans English translations do you have now, Jim? Oh, over a thousand. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. Yeah. So we are the most privileged people, and we have the writings of Ellen White. Furthermore, we could be the people who will see Jesus come back to this earth. Okay, Jim? How can we harmonize our dwarfed spiritual condition with the presentation of our text, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, that describes the fullness of knowledge it is our privilege to possess? How can heaven, 
look upon us who have had every spiritual and temporal advantage that we might grow in grace when we have not improved our opportunities. The apostle did not write these words to tantalize us, to deceive us, or to raise our expectations, only to have them disappointed in their experience. He wrote these words to show us that we may and must be, if we could be heirs of the kingdom of God, how can we, excuse me, how can we be laborers together with God? If we have a dwarfed experience, we have a knowledge of the Christian privilege and should seek that deep spiritual understanding in the things of God that the Lord has desired us to have. Do we, ha do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe that we may attain to the knowledge of God that is presented before us in this text? Do we believe every word that has proceeded out of the mouth of God? Do we believe that the words that have been spoken by prophets and apostles, by Jesus Christ, who is the author of all light and blessing, and in whom dwelleth all richness and fullness, do we really believe in God and in his Son? Ellen White, Advent Review of the Sabbath Herald, October 1, 1889. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the history of the Adventist Church, this came almost exactly one year after what? Went to Australia. Well, no, she was. She hadn't she gone there a yet. Year before she went to Australia. The 1888. The 1888? Yeah, Minneapolis. Conference in Minneapolis, yeah. yeah. And look at what she's asking now. Do we really, do we really believe? Do we really believe? Do we really believe? Wow. After assuming the Gentiles, that they, assuring the Gentiles, I'm sorry, that they are to be a part of God's chosen people, along with the Jews, Paul assured them that this was not a new idea. This has been God's plan since before the world was created. And just to review Ephesians 3, verse 11, God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Jesus Christ Jesus our Lord. From time to time in his writings in the book of Ephesians and elsewhere, Paul interrupted himself and gave a brief doxology praising God for what he was writing about. And you wonder how, when I read this, I wonder, okay, did God reveal something to him in vision at nighttime while he was sleeping? And then he woke up in the morning and he tried to write it down? Or did, was God working him with him just as he was, excuse me, just as he was writing? Okay, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. I think that's yours, Kerry. To him who by means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. Amen. It's from the Good News Bible. I keep going. Go ahead. Paul has been recording his prayers for believers, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 to 19 verses. Now he prays directly and powerfully. Paul's doxology raises two questions. One, does the passage inappropriately elevate the church, placing it on a par with Christ in the phrase, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ? Ephesians 3:21. there's a question mark there. Mm -hmm. While Paul is highly interested in the church in Ephesians, it is clear that Christ is the Savior of the church since it is Christ who dwells in the heart of believers. Ephesians 3.17 In the doxology, Paul praises God for the salvation... Or of, healing. What's that? Salvation or healing. Oh, salvation or healing. Oh, I missed one, didn't I? No, no, you did. it's not there. I just added that. Oh, okay. And it praises for God's salvation to the church through Christ Jesus. Does the phrase throughout all generations, forever and ever, Ephesians 3.21, uh, portray an unending, earthbound future for the church with the return of Christ put on hold? Ephesians exhibits a robust expectation for the future. For example, Ephesians 4.30 looks toward the day of redemption, and the 
the ASV, also believers will experience Christ's limitless sovereign power in the age to come. I'm going to interrupt there for a moment. Okay. Paul is writing from prison. This is, uh, we have already talked about the fact that, you know, he, he, he could have woken up any morning and known that that, found out that that was a day for his head to be chopped off. Yeah. But there he is, and he's writing this kind of language. Yeah. It's amazing. It just amazes me when I read that. Yeah, it really is. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul's doxology should be read as a celebration of Christ's unending power exercised on behalf of believers. And that's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. But there's the August 3. Yeah. Do we remember the blessings God gives us and thank Him often? When reading these passages from Paul, one of the challenges for Christians in our day is to understand what God's plan for the Israel-slash-church relationship was and is. Many different ideas have been expressed. Some of those ideas follow in this long quotation from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. So this is lengthy. We're going to take one paragraph at a time. I'll read the first paragraph, and then Jim can read a paragraph. This is a fairly lengthy one. But the issue is, how should the church in our day, the Adventist, the Seventh-day Adventist church in our day, and, and for that matter, other Christian churches in our day, relate to Jews and the country of Israel? And of course, what do we know about what many of them say about the relationship to Israel? They're already planning to build a new temple, the third temple in Jerusalem. They believe that the time has come. They believe the time is coming. Some of them think it's going to be Jesus himself that comes down and rules from Jerusalem. But others just simply think that there's the, you know, the world is going to get better and better. They're going to conquer all the evil in the world and they're going to rule the world from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, look. The discussion on the Jews and the Gentiles united in Christ's body raises the issue of the relationship between the Christian church and Israel. Christians have developed different models of the Israel church relation. One traditional position is that Israel was God's covenant nation, but that after Israel as a nation rejected Jesus as the Messiah, Israel as a nation was rejected and was replaced by the church. So that's a pretty common idea. Therefore, after Christ, Israel does not fulfill any role in God's economy of salvation and healing. Other theologians took a literalistic interpretation of Scripture and developed the dispensational theory that Christ and the church, I'm sorry, that Israel and the church represent two different periods of, uh, two different peoples of God. These peoples have different calls, different covenants, different paths of salvation, and different purposes in the economy of salvation. So let me ask you the question. Do, were people saved for, differently in the Old Testament than they are saved in the New Testament? No, I wouldn't think so. It's, mm -hmm. take, take, take as an example, we say Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they it was later on that they finally began to understand the, the God's character. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, look at uh, Elijah. We're not kill, killed how many? 450 priests or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then it wasn't until he was out there, had chased away from, by uh, Jezebel. And then it was, God is not in the earth. Quake the wind and the fire. He talks softly. Yes. Even a cursory reading of Paul and of the New Testament reveals that both these theories are problematic and that the dispensational approach to the Israeli church, Israel church relation <clears throat> is especially contrary to what the apostle envisioned. Several major points of Paul's view on the Israel church relation could be made here. First, Paul viewed an essential continuity between Israel and the church. So what, is it, what are we saying when we say that? There's not a difference to what, between the way people are saved in the Old Testament and the way they're saved in the New Testament. Now, the circumstances were very different in the Old Testament. Well, Deuteronomy 6, yeah. hear, O Israel, mm -hmm. listen. Mark, mm -hmm. was it Mark 6 or Mark 12? Mm -hmm. Listen. The most yeah. important thing you can do is to listen. 
This relationship is to be understood in the context of the overarching biblical interpretive uh, principle of promise fulfillment. Christ and the New Testament people of God are the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God saved Israel and called it to proclaim God's covenants and promises of grace in the world. Through Israel, God's call to receive his promises of grace and to join his covenants were to reach all the families and nations of the earth. Israel was not a mission, Israel's was not a mission of imperial development in which Israel was to conquer and annex all the nations of the earth. Rather, the nations were expected to join God's covenant and promises as opposed to joining a national or an imperial entity. So what was God's original plan? The Jews were placed at the crossroads of the world, weren't they? Yeah. And the idea was that they were supposed to teach the truth about God to all the nations coming and going. This Old Testament, therefore, the Old Testament, therefore, was looking forward to a, a supranational structure of God's people in which people of all nations would be part of the same covenant with God. And I can't help but thinking that as evil as uh, the Internet has become, yeah. it's still a means for the gospel to spread to the entire world. This supernatural structure was fulfilled in the New Testament people of God, composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Clearly, it was and is God's plan that Jews and Gentiles are to join God's universal family and become one people. Second, and con consequently, Israel and the church are not two peoples of God that coexist in parallel, each of them with their covenants, paths to salvation, and missions. I want to think about that for a moment. Was there, is, can we perceive any difference between the way God wanted to relate to the people in the Old Testament and the way he wants to relate to people in the New Testament? I don't see if, you know, you got to read between the lines, but I think what God said to the Old Testament was not different than what's in the New Testament. And so, Think of how many times Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. Yeah. You know, even, you know, love for God and love for your fellow men, straight out of the Old Testament. Rather, Christ explained that the mission was to bring his other sheep that are not in this fold so that they will become one flock with one shepherd, John 10, 16. Nor is the church simply the replacement of Israel as a nation in the sense that Israel was the nation of God until Christ, and now after Christ rejected Israel as a nation, the church is the new people of God. Rather, for Paul, the church is not a different people of God, but the fulfillment of the amazing promise of God in the Old Testament. He calls all humanity to his grace. That is why in Romans 9, Paul views the church as comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. And if you remember, Romans 9, 10, and 11, what do they, what do they talk about? Remember? Romans 9, 10, and 11 are all about God saying, okay, I'm sorry, not God saying, well, God, through Paul, Paul says, these are my people. These are where, that's where I came from. I'm out here preaching to the Gentiles, but I really care about my people. And he talks about... He's praying for them and he talks about how they should have received the gospel and they should be doing what he was doing in great detail yeah. in those three chapters. True, only a remnant of Israel joined the community gathered around Jesus, Romans 9, 27 and 29. I think we have time. Let me just look at that really quick. And Isaiah exclaims about Israel, even if the people of Israel are as many as the grains of sand by the sea, yet only a few of them will be saved. For the Lord will quickly settle his full account with the world. It is as Isaiah had said before, if the Lord Almighty had not left us some descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. That's why it's called a, a remnant. Yep, exactly. But it is precisely this remnant, Jim, there you go, that shows that God did not reject Israel's taking part in, uh, in the church. Romans 11.1. 1. It is this remnant that ensures 
the continuity and unity between, Christ, between Israel and the church. So uh, what are Adventists doing for Israel, you know? We have started a ministry. Uh, we have converted a... I, and Carrie, you know about that from um, our Adventist World... Uh, what's it called? Adventist World Radio. Adventist World Radio, yeah. 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 A man there has become an Adventist and his life has been threatened. They tried to kill him with a, with a uh, knife and the knife just bent around in 180 degrees. They tried to, like this, and the knife bent as they were trying to stab him. I forgot about him. Yeah, and he's doing a marvelous work there. He's, yeah. People are coming, Jews are responding. For this reason, uh, in Romans 11, 16 to 18, Paul compares the church with the olive tree. Some branches are the children of Israel and other branches are the Gentiles. But all the branches ultimately are fed by the same root. Yeah. That is, God's covenant with Abraham. God always had one plan of salvation, one seed who was Christ, one promise, one covenant, and one people. And I'm going to take just a moment to uh, look back here and just remind you what he said way back in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, this is, he, he's calling Abram, this is at the beginning of Abraham's life. Leave your country, your relatives and your father's home and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you and through you I will bless who? All the nations. That was God's plan back when he first called Abraham. Yeah. We wasn't even Abraham yet. He was called Abram. So, um, this same idea, the one plan of God, the continuity between Israel and the church, and therefore the essentiality of the unity of the church resurfaces again in Ephesians 2 and 3. Paul explains to the Ephesians that the church is comprised both of circumcised and uncircumcised. Do we go and check at the door to see who's circumcised and who's uncircumcised? <laughs> you mean, the committee I would want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> you remember Paul talks about that when... Some things you can't unsee. Yeah. <laughs> the apostle does not say that the Jews and the church are two separate peoples or that the church replaced the Jews as God's people. Far from excluding the Jews from the church, Paul follows Jesus' theology and affirms that salvation comes from the Jews, John 4, 22. For this reason, Paul emphasizes that while the Gentiles were far away, the Jews were near, Ephesians 2, 17. Elsewhere, Paul describes this nearness in terms of having received God's promise or covenants. So, God's prophecies, the Messiah, God's mission to share them all with the world. So what do we have in terms of the gospel? What do we have from the Jews? Virtually everything, right? Yeah. The Bible, Jesus was a Jew. I mean, the think about it. Were, uh, the apostles, almost all the Jews. apostles were Jews. Absolutely. Thus it is the Gentiles who are brought near to God and built on the same foundation of the Hebrew prophets as opposed to building on the foundations of their old myths and philosophies. Yeah. This unity between Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles was necessary because God's ultimate plan was and is to bring the entire universe together in harmony, peace, and love. So we've talked about that. This is, these used to be, remember, you, well, you quoted it. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. That must have seemed impossible to the onlooking universe as that, uh, at that point in time. How do you see the world in our day? Does it seem like God is making any progress in producing a unified, loving family on this earth? I think there is here and there, yes. Here and there, the, okay. The, the, the devil doesn't get everything. No, he doesn't. Some of the mail you get here and there, there's people laboring in, in areas that we don't even remember or think yeah. of. Yeah. We're going to be we're going to learn so many incredible stories when we get to heaven about 
people have worked here and there, like you said, all kinds of places and not all kinds. Some circles. We, I mean, even in our day. But what? How, what if you go back through all the ages past? What kind of stories were there? Third, even when speaking of the foundation of the church, Paul uses the same idea of the continuity of Israel and the church this time in terms of revelation. The church is built on divine revelation. But God does not have two discontinuous revelations, the Old and the New Testaments. He did not reveal something in the Old Testament only to abandon his plan and reveal a totally new project. His plan is one, and his revelation is one and continuous. That is why Paul emphasizes that the church is built on both the apostles and the prophets. And what does it say about that in Revelation? Where are the prophets? They are the foundation. The well, the, four, the fathers, the foundations and the, and the disciples are the gates of the new Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Um, see, also, also John's description of the new Jerusalem, wherein the apostles' names are inscribed on the foundations of the city and the names of the patriarchs are inscribed on the gates. Yet the apostles and the patriarchs are integrated in the same new Jerusalem, God's dwelling place, Revelation 21, 10 to 14. The reason for, listening, for listing the apostles first is perhaps that the apostles are greater than the prophets in the same sense that John the Baptist was greater than all the prophets. This greatness is to be understood in the same sense of promised fulfillment. And now I'm beginning to worry about this when Paul said, I'm the least of all the saints. Why are we talking about the greatness? While the prophets prophesied the coming of the Messiah, the apostles announced his real historical uh, advent in the world. The Messiah whom the apostles proclaimed as having come into the world was the same Messiah seen by their prophets in their visions. The apostles and the prophets were united in their testimony, which is the foundation of the church. And fourth, we're running out of time. Paul's view in the Israel, of the Israel church relation also reveals he understood the identity and character of God. The God of Israel is not their national God. He is the God of the whole earth and I would add of the entire universe. While his earthly residence may be in Jerusalem, his jurisdiction is not limited to Judea and the surrounding areas. And we need to close there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these revelations we have of the wording in Ephesians as you inspired Paul writing from prison. We don't even know what where that prison was located, or how serious, what, what kind of privileges Paul had. But here he is writing these marvelous words to us. Help us to get them and to understand them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.